Hey everyone, thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of StaggerCast. In today's special episode, I sat down with the Sargent Brothers from Waterbury, Vermont. These guys, along with their friends, have been chasing big bucks in the North Main Woods for over 40 years. What makes it unique and even more of an adventure is they've been doing it out of a wall tent set up in the backcountry off an old main logging road. Get ready for some incredible stories, memories, and wisdom from their decades of hunting adventures. Let's dive right in with the Sargent Brothers. You're listening to Stagger Cast, brought to you by Stagger Gear. To get it kicked off, I know a lot of people that are listening probably won't know you guys. So why don't you guys uh, introduce yourselves, get a little bit of background on who you are, what you do, where you're from, that type of stuff. Ken Sargent, I'm the oldest of the Sargent boys. I live here in Waterbury, retired from the town of Waterbury. And uh, I'm Gary Sargent. I'm the middle Sargent boy. And uh, I live in West Bend, Wisconsin now. Um, retired from a company called Alto Shim in Menominee Falls. Nice. Jim? And I'm the youngest, Jim. Yeah, the youngest being going to be 66. Yep. So that shows you our age. But, yeah. That's wisdom uh, right there. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yep. So you and guys I live in Waterbury also. Yep. So you're all from Waterbury to start originally. Uh, we we grew up in Burlington. So we actually, we were, came from Johnson. Yeah. Johnson. Johnson. So you guys have been all over the place. Yeah. 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 And then now you guys hunt in Maine primarily, which uh, I was down here the other day chatting with uh, Jim and Ken, and they were showing me all the pictures, Gary, and you guys got a ton of memories. And I said, oh, we got to sit down sometimes and, and record this because there's a lot of history there, Maine deer hunting and all that. Yeah. So why don't you guys start at the beginning? I know you were Vermont hunters to begin with, and then you guys kind of slowly became Maine transplants when when November rolls around. So let's start at the beginning. Yeah, we got a camp in Eden, and we started hunting, deer hunting in Eden back in the 60s. Uh, We talked about going to Maine for about 10 years, and finally we, uh, one fall, we were talking with Larry Benoit, and he said, we ought to take a weekend and go up, and he said, I'll show you some areas. So we did that. We went up through and went to Cacaggio, mm. and we ended up renting a camp there at Cacaggio. And the first year that we hunted in Maine uh, was about 1981, and we hunted the Big Spencers. And I fortunately got a deer, 191-pound small buck. Uh, that was the only deer that we got that year. And then we decided that after that year that we needed to move areas. So we picked another area up in the north main woods and uh been there pretty much ever since nice so you got you got one your first year up there yes that's quite the accomplishment yeah 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 not as much luck for you the first year jim no i don't think i think there was only jay was the only one that saw another saw a deer yeah it was so thick up there at that point that the growth was was just you couldn't hardly get through it it was the first week of the hunt and it was bluebird weather you know 50s and 60s and so on bare ground so it was a Hunting bare ground in Maine is a whole different story. Mm-hmm. Uh, the hunting is completely different than Vermont. There's probably some areas up in the Northeast Kingdom that's very similar, but uh, it took us a couple of years when we were in Maine to uh, find out where the deer were, how to hunt it, and so on. And then we, after a year or two, we we shot the first 200-pounder that we got. Mm-hmm. And never looked back since then, right? Uh, no, we haven't hunted Vermont since yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It took us a, a couple of years to figure out that we needed to be in Maine instead of Vermont. Yeah. And you said you were talking to Larry in the beginning, huh? Yeah. he. Yeah. Uh, we went up, spent a week, took a tent with us and went up and drove around. We went to uh, Eustis and we went up through Flagstaff and Rangeley and then we went, ended up uh, at Cacaggio there and he showed us uh, the Spencers. They were, had hunted there years before that and he said, oh, we don't hunt here anymore, but he said, I think it would be a good area for you guys to come up and try yep so we did and like i say i was fortunate to get a small buck and uh it's been uphill since then yeah yeah you guys got a lot of memories up there so i I know you said uh after that first year you moved and then you started wall tenting for the most part right and you still can't do that the first first year first couple years i would say three or four years we had a we had a camper we rented a camper the first year and it was pretty ratty when we when we found an adventure 
<laughs> yes. Uh, so then we decided we would buy our own camper. So then mm -hmm. we went that route, and we had a camper for probably five or six years, and we'd only go for like the first week of the season. Oh, that's it? So we never, yeah, we didn't at the time, uh, had young families and so on, and we couldn't get the time off from work. So we would go up there for a week and then come back and spend weekends in Vermont. But mm -hmm. uh, and, and back then we still believed that we had to, we had to be back in Vermont for opening weekend yeah. at camp. Yeah. And so we would traditionally go up the first week of uh, the season in Maine, and every year it'd be bare ground. And, you know, every once in a while we'd get a little bit of snow, but, then we finally smartened up and said, you know what, we need to spend more time up here and we need to come a little later in the season so that we can spend time on snow up here and, and uh, get after the big bucks. Yep. Was it just the size of the deer that drew you in back then to make you go the whole month of Maine up there? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I don't blame it's, you. It's, uh, it spoils you for back here. Yep. Yeah. You know, in Eden especially, and the, the mountains in Eden, they're pretty rugged, so mm -hmm. we can't handle that anymore. Yep. So you picked a pull off up there somewhere. We don't need to name any locations or anything, but uh, and then that's when it turned into the wall camp. Yeah, we yeah. set the, we set the trailer up there for a couple of years, and then we had a we had issues getting the wool dried. If it rained, and yeah. it would take you two three days to get your wool dried. So then we we constructed a little portable building out of four by four panels that just bolted together. Oh, okay, and we had a wood stove in there, and we could set our wolves in there when we get back at night and dry out to dry out the wolves we sit in there and have a beer or whatever yeah. and tell yeah. stories yeah tell the day yeah and so on and we went that route for well till about 1985 or so and then they started cutting up in the area where we were camping and they shut the roads off mm -hmm. so we found a gravel pit and we spent about 25 years camping in that gravel pit and we went from the little small building, we bought a GP medium tent hmm. with a winter liner in it. So then we started tenting, and we used the uh, camper uh, kitchen facilities and had a shower in there. Yep. And we used that for, gosh, I don't know, must have been 10 years. There were four of us that stayed in the camper, right? and us three boys and then my, our brother-in-law, Jay. Yep. That's tight, putting yeah, four well, guys in yeah. a camper. <laughs> you must have more room once you pop that tent bunk, up. There was a bunk bed there, you know, up top, and I used to sleep in there. And yep. then there was one underneath, and then the table made into a bed. Mm -hmm. So there was three there, and then there was a bunk down below, too. Yeah. There was two, one on either side. Yeah. Story, story to go along with that, uh, the first year we went up there, we were riding around, and up at the end of the Golden Road, the state of Maine had a house that the warden hmm. lived in. So we went up and we were told, Larry told us that the warden lived up there. So we said, well, we'll take a trip up there someday and see if we can meet the guy and so on, talk to him. And so we drove up and he come out and introduced himself. And he said, uh, my name's Gary Sargent. <laughs> and Gary pipes up and says, well, my name's Gary Sargent. <laughs> So we met the warden, a uh, heck of a nice guy, young fella. Uh, him and his wife lived at the Boundary Cottage here at the end of the Golden Road. And uh, he used to come down uh, late in the afternoon. Iris, Larry's wife, made donuts. Mm. And she'd call us up before we went to Maine in the fall. She said, well, I got your donuts ready. Make sure you come get them. Can't beat that. So we'd go get the donuts and so on. Well, he was kind of partial to the donuts. So he uh, he knew about the time we were getting back to the camper at night. So pretty near every night, he'd come over and have a cup of coffee and a donut. Can't blame the guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we visited. He was, like I said, he was there for two or three years. And then his wife was going to have a baby and she didn't want to be up in the Northwood. So right. they moved They moved down country. And uh, a new warden, Mike Favreau, mm -hmm was the warden that come in there and he was there for 18 years wow up there in he, that raised, house. So, he raised his family there and his yeah. he had two girls and they went to school in canada no kidding yeah, yeah. that's that's interesting i didn't know they did that they yeah. still do that up there with the they still have a warden house or is it more just the, mobile the house is still there and uh, our understanding is that they've just promoted a new warden that just got out of school and he'll be stationed there now nice. i don't know the house was getting it was vacant for it's been 10 years or better, so Pretty it, was, rough. it was getting dilapidated, but it was at one time, it was a nice uh, 
nice house. Yeah. yeah. Oh, they got the state's money behind it now, so yeah. I'm sure they'll uh, polish it up pretty good for him. That's interesting, though. I mean, it's a good thing to have up there because it's so remote, you know. Oh, yeah. There's a lot, because, a lot of guys uh, up there. Yeah. The wardens now come out of uh, Greenville, and it takes mm. them an hour and a half, two hours to get there if they have a call. Yep. We always wished that we could come through that way because when you come, we used to go through May, uh, through Canada to get, mm-hmm. you know, in, into Jackman. And uh, it would, it's three hours from border to border. Really? From Derby Line to Jackman. Yeah. Nice. Oh, that's a lot quicker than going. And, it's, and when yeah. you come into, from Canada, you make a 90 degree turn mm-hmm. to go ahead to Jackman. You were, we were 12 miles as the crow flies from where we camp. Oh, no kidding. And it's. 70 or 80 miles around yeah because you guys are going all that's a long day of driving yeah what you're telling me before it takes what what seven hours to get up there uh, six hours to jackman or greenville and then another couple hours to get up in where we hunt yeah that's a long day of driving i don't blame you for going up for the whole month i wouldn't want to do that drive every weekend so well now that we're retired you know all three of us are retired Mm -hmm. four of us jay is also yeah Mm -hmm. you know we have the time now and yep families are grown yep so going back to, you know, the early days when you guys got the tent set up and, and hunker down up there, what was the hunting like back then compared to now, per se? What was yeah. the landscape like? What was the pressure like? Take me through all that back it in was, the day. It was 80s. probably all second growth timber, uh, big beaches, big maples and so on, and no roads. No roads at all? No roads. It was one road that went up in, and, and they punched a skid road in. They went for a couple of years and never did anything with it. They just roughed it in. And if you hunted, uh, you started on where we parked a camper, you could go for four, five, six hours in a straight line mm-hmm. and never cross a road. That's you, that's unheard of now in Maine. You oh, you, do, you, you can't, can't do, do it. That There's now. roads everywhere. Yeah. And it was uh, a lot less hunters. Mm-hmm. Uh, Except for Canadians. There were a lot more Canadians back then. All the Canadians yeah. were coming down? Yeah. Yes. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. You don't see that at all nowadays. No, well, they, they have to have guides. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. Interesting. When, yeah. when uh, Quebec put that law in that you had to hunt with a guide in Quebec, mm. Maine did the same thing. Ah, uh, a little gutcha thing so, going there. Yeah. Yeah. Little, yeah. yeah. So it was uh, it was different. Like I say, you never you never see another hunter in the woods. Mm-hmm. Uh other than your own party. Yeah. Most yeah. every deer you see was probably a 200-pounder. I mean, that isn't to say that there wasn't some small deer, but there was a lot more bigger deer back in the olden days. And I think because they didn't have the access, mm-hmm. that's why the, the, the deer were so big. And they hadn't cut all the softwood so they could yard just about anywhere. Yeah, yeah. they didn't have to go all the way down into town. Those huge spruce and, yeah. swamps yeah. up there. Yeah, And they weren't pressured at all. I mean... Half of those deer died before they ever saw anybody but a logger. Yeah. Really? Yeah. No kidding. I mean, it makes sense without yeah. the access and, yeah, yeah. it's interesting. Yeah, we, we got into a lot of areas, and one of the things that were very was very prevalent when we first got there, you know, we the, the three of us and our brother-in-law, Jay, we're kind of wanderers, you know. We, the woods, we grew up in the big woods of Vermont, and we weren't intimidated by the big woods of Maine, so we would just take off and back then – you know, there was no roads in except for old, what they, on the maps, they call them Jeep trails. And those Jeep trails were old grown up log roads that you could, you they know, were beautiful or just moose paths. Yeah. And you could walk those and, and we would look at the topo map and we'd say, this ridge over here looks good. Let's go hunt that today. And we'd take off and go and, and, you know, we might go five miles before we started to hunt and get back in these areas. And, and we covered just so much territory. And we learned the area. And then when they put in the roads, it's like, oh, wow, now we can get in these areas in no time. And, you know, we started hunting different different areas. And and it, it changed the dynamics up there when they punched in all the roads. After they got done logging, there was so many people around now that were never there uh, before. You know, you had a little more pressure. But, you know, we, we got into places. And every ridge up there, every hardwood ridge had an old maple, you know, had an old sugar house on it. And a lot of them were still standing when we first got up there and started going. Some of them even had horse barns and you could go inside some of the, you know, the camps and we would rummage around in them and stuff on days that weren't worth hunting. And, uh, we'd have a lot of fun lugging stuff out of the woods (laughs) and a lot of history up there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I didn't, I mean, I've heard of, uh, 
some of the old sugar and shacks back in the day, but that was pre logging and everything because yeah. it was all a lot more, you know, rolling hardwood and stuff, kind of like Vermont is now, right? Compared to now, it's a lot. It's we always year, right? wondered what they what happened to them because a lot of the ones that were up th- there, they had their wood all cut, their arches, their pans were turned over on the arch, and all the wood was cut and stacked on, you know, in there, mm-hmm. and they just abandoned just them, gone. Yeah. yeah, was it? owned by like international paper and, and warehouser and all those paper companies then or did they just get bought well, out I, and were forced to i think it was great northern but before 9 11 uh back in the old days all the sugar and it was getting done up there was done by canadians mm. and there was a border but nobody uh you know nobody recognized it they just come in from canada for the sugar and season so they would just come right down and oh, yeah. start sugaring yeah and they you know they sugared and like he said, we we found probably a dozen different places and uh, and so on over the over the years. And then once they started logging and so on in there, they'd run over the buildings with skidders, just and bust them. them down. Yeah. Jeez, that's kind of that's just kind of sad, you know. It it's is a piece of history, a main history that's yeah. gone and forgotten. But we've lugged out bow saws and cross cut saws, and yep. got the doors off that were made in. Uh, Leader evaporator in Burlington at that time. Oh, no kidding. And yeah, one of the set of doors off of one nice. arch and stuff. And Some nice souvenirs. Yeah. 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 And a lot of buckets. Yeah. They had the small buckets that were tall and skinny. Yeah. Or they used lard pails. A lot, lot of lard pails. Really? So yeah. they weren't running any lines back then, was it? Oh, just no. Not, just all buckets. Yeah. Horse drawn yeah. carriages, yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. We found nice. buckets of. The first ones that we had were just bent tin sharpened on one end mm-hmm. in like a V, spouts. the spouts. Yep. And then they were down to uh, cedar ones that were all turned down and they had a hole drilled in them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So they drill the hole and knock in a cedar spout and just walk up to it, pull it out and yeah. Yeah, let them drain. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. It makes you wonder about what the deer hunting was like back then, you know, when the big sugar was going on, if there was... A lot more deer then, or or how it's set up makes you wonder. I don't know. I I got a feeling that there was plenty of plenty of deer because there was you know there was plenty of softwood cover and so on for them. And then about 1984, 85, uh, they had the, the spruce budworm mm. infestation, and it was killing a lot of the softwood. So to get their money back, they went in and started clear cutting. cutting. Cutting softwood like there was no tomorrow. Mm-hmm. It's nothing to find a hundred or two hundred acre clear cut where they just went in and mopped everything. Yep. But yeah. we had one road up there. We drove in and checked it out when they got done cutting, and uh, there was a great big skitter there, and it had a big sign on it side said Locomo, and down that road, that road went for almost a mile long, and the softwood was stacked up on both sides of the road, twelve to fifteen feet high. For a mile long. That's a lot of wood. Yeah. Jeez. And just to give you an idea, they, they had four wheels on the front of it and four on the back, mm-hmm. you know, so there was eight. One of those giant ones. Yeah, a giant yeah. one, and, you, and they had lags on them. And I stood up next to the tires, and they they were higher than my head, mm-hmm. and I was six foot. Yeah, six so foot boys one. are pulling some wood out of that. Oh, yeah. Jeez, yeah. that's yeah. insane. Yeah. yeah. So back then when you guys were hunting, was so it was a lot of, like, good mix woods? compared to now yes. where it's a lot more slash so yes there's a lot of stuff you up in maine now it's so hard to get you just oh, you know, brushes, avoid it because it's so unbelievable terrible. Yeah. yeah when they logged but back then they used to bring slashers down to the header mm. and they would drag them out full length the trees they didn't leave the tops in the woods mm, so you're not stripping they'd, on everything they'd bring right. it out and they'd limit all at the yep limit all there next to the landing and then they'd slash it into the lengths they wanted and mm-hmm. now they have the processor heads and all oh, yeah, that stuff ends up in the road for yeah. corduroy stuff, and you can't walk out the log roads like you used to be able to. Mm-hmm. How were the moose back then? Are they doing better then? A lot, too? Of, a lot of moose. A lot more it moose. It was nothing. Uh, when we they started making those clear cuts, uh, I can remember one day we were driving up in to hunt, and it was uh, five or six bulls, big bulls, all together out in one of those clear cuts. Really? Yeah. Just hanging out? Oh, just hanging out. And, you know, that was before that uh, the moose hunt really got going and so on and uh nowadays you don't see them from the road very often yeah. they're moving if you do yeah, all the dumb ones got shot off the yes. side of the I, I saw as many as 13 in a day before just cruising around or just, just uh, no uh, during just, the days hunting, of hunting just, yeah, yeah you'd be running into them every time you turned around yeah and quite a few bears yeah, yeah. 
And you guys never had a moose permit up there, have you? We never did. Never no. did? Ever apply? or just No, we never have. We yeah. did back in the early days. We applied a few times, but never got drawn. Yeah, yeah. That's those are cool animals. It's, yeah. I still see them. They're definitely out there, but oh, yeah. like I said, away from the roads. Yeah. A lot of the dumb ones got smacked from the road and that and during the season. So, but uh, they're still around for sure. Oh yeah, yeah. We, they we, got a big, we see them. Yeah, yeah. They had a big kill off up there with the, you know, with the the uh, brain worm um, infestation, and you know we would hunt down flowages. A lot of times we'd spread out and hunt either side of them in the transition woods, softwoods, hardwoods. And we found pile after pile after pile of moose bones along those flowages yep. where they just, they died from the, you know, from the, the uh, brain worm. Mm-hmm. That's and, too bad. and it used to be when we first went up there in the spring, we'd go up and make a spring trip. And we'd find sheds right in the middle of the road, the log roads really? and stuff. They just hang out in the roads. Yeah, walk. they'd be dropping their antlers. I mean, that's how we bought our first tent. Was, our, was second tent. our second tent. Our, yeah, um, really? We Selling moose sheds? Sell, yeah. Sold moose sheds. No kidding. We had a stack about three or four feet high of sheds that we'd found over the years. Wow. Do you, yeah. Where'd you sell those? You just, anybody? You go to a shop? Well, or there's a specified there place? was a fellow up in Waterbury Center that bought them. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah that's a big thing now. There's That's uh, shed hunting has oh, grown yeah. a lot in the last five yeah. to 10 years. I mean, there's people out there probably as we're sitting here recording this out there, you know, up on the top of a mountain scraping them yeah. out in the snow. Yeah. But they're yeah. worth some money. Oh yeah, yeah. Buy your second tent. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. They, they was... paid us. Eight, they paid us eight dollars a pound. Nice. And I had enough so that we we made over nine hundred dollars. No kidding. Most, That's a good haul. On yeah. sheds <laughs> for some free and, sheds uh, laying in the road. Jeez. Yeah. 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 And we hauled them out of the woods. We'd find them in the woods, and you mark them. Sometimes we'd mark them with a our GPS and go back in the spring when we were up there looking around. We we'd go back in and get them because, you know, if you're hunting, you didn't really want to take the time to lug a moose antler out every day, but Mm -hmm. a lot of times we would. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Make a little stockpile of them, come back and get them after. Yeah. There were a lot of years before the GPS, we started hunting up there though. We always used these compasses and. Yep. Oh yeah. Yeah. Always carried a couple of compasses, had a ball compass on our coat and Mm -hmm. one, one in or two in your pockets. (laughs) That's a dying thing too. I know. I mean, obviously knowing how to use a compass is highly important. Everybody should do it. But now everybody, you know, a lot of reliance on the, the technology on X and yes. all that stuff. So it definitely changes the game. As far as access to people, there's no hidden spots anymore. Oh, no. You know, everybody no. knows everything. Same yeah. with lake fishing, which I've talked about before on the podcast. But so when you talk about Maine back in the 80s and the 90s and stuff, when people call it the golden days of Maine, is it true? Was it yeah, a lot yeah more bountiful I, I, and... I think so. I think there was a lot more bigger deer. I mean, the deer population in the last couple of years uh, in the area that we're hunting seems like it's coming back. Mm. Uh, this past fall, we see 10 or a dozen bucks. The group did. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's uh, the old days, you didn't see that many. Mm-hmm. Yep. You but got, what the chances were, were you were going to see a 200-pounder. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. I was just going to say a lot of them, back then were the subordinates and stuff that we were seeing a lot of. And, you know, we, we transitioned like, like a lot of hunters do. We transitioned from when we first went to Maine, we weren't all that picky about the bucks that we shot. You know, we, we tried to shoot decent and sure bucks, but um, we weren't necessarily hunting for, you know, trophy bucks or 200 pounders every time. But then we transitioned in, into a period where we all passed up a lot of, you know, subordinate bucks. And, you know, we were there for one reason, and that was to shoot a big buck. Mm-hmm. Nice. So how many out of camp over the years, over 200 pounds, did you guys take? What's the, what's the number? Our group has shot between uh, 15 and 20 or 25, That's 200 pounds. a lot pounders. of nice bucks. Yeah. Jeez. Closer to 25, I'd say. Yeah. And more. Between, between everybody in our group. Yeah, because you guys have some friends and stuff that come in and cycle out. And, we do. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, not as many as what we once did, Uh one of the fellows has passed on, and a couple of the others are in their 80s, and they gave up hunting. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm in hopes to keep going for a couple more years, yeah, but we'll have to wait and see. Absolutely. Keep on going. It keeps yeah. you young up there. Yeah. 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 We don't go like we used to, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Hey, nothing wrong with no. that, though. As long as you're enjoying it, that's all that matters. Yeah. yeah. And this year, I found out that, you know, when your birthdays are going to start with sevens, um, that you get on those uh, bucks that are trying out for the North Main Woods Olympic team. And uh, <laughs> yeah. they take you five or six miles, and you don't even get a, a glimpse of them. I realized that uh, I might have to change my tactics a little bit. 
<laughs> going forward. <laughs> yep. Yep. You guys, I know Jim, you said you're mixing in some more sitting and stuff. Uh, uh, yeah, I have to, I, I've yep. had two bouts with cancer, so I yep. don't get around like I used to at all. Mm-hmm. So okay. I've relegated it to after I fell down three or four times last year, trying to go through the clear cuts and stuff, I said, well, there's enough of this. So mm-hmm. I put up a blind and mm-hmm. waiting them out. Ain't nothing yeah. wrong with that. There's plenty of cuts to sit in. Up I'm there, pretty so. patient. I'm a good, I, a big turkey hunter and I, mm-hmm. I do a lot of sitting. Mm-hmm. So, yep. Nice. So we'll, uh, we should dive into some deer stories in a minute. Um, but one quick question I have before we do that. What was the snow conditions like back then? Was there a lot more snow you're getting back then or is about the same as now i've heard people say mixed thing like older guys are saying like oh yeah we used to get a lot more snow every week and then some people are like nah it's about the same what I do th- you guys think? i think the last couple of weeks the third and the fourth week you were more apt to have snow in the old days but uh we were up there one year uh the second week and we got 30 inches overnight 30 inches 30 inches oh my god so yeah. i mean you don't know that like this year uh, we had probably six inches uh, the first of the season there, and mm-hmm. you know we had halfway decent snow for the first week, mm-hmm. which is in the last couple of years hasn't been the hasn't been the norm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 2018 we had uh, in the end of the third week into the into the fourth week we had three feet of snow on the ground. That's up tough there. hunting right there. It in was, 2018. It was yeah. up to your crotch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Were the deer moving around much then, or were they just kind of hungry? They were yeah. migrating. If, were they heading down? If yeah. you uh, jumped them, we we drove by a couple doe two or three days in a row, and we said, what the hell are we doing here? There's doe right here in the road every morning. Maybe we ought to drop in there. Mm-hmm. And after that time, the snow, had, it had warmed up overnight, and it had dropped about 12 or 15 inches overnight. And after the second day, the snow was down to about a foot, foot and a half, and you could get around. And we went in there, and we ended up shooting three bucks in two days. Just around those doe groups. Yeah. Right yeah, they'd all come in. The, apparently, the bucks had come in looking for the does. And, nice. And Can't so, beat that. No. All the, How many? It was two or three, you said? Yeah. Jeez. Well, I don't remember which year it was that they had the big snow up there. That they had so many winter killed. They, 2008 and nine. they were back-to-back winters, mm-hmm. and that— that really depleted the the herd there. Those because it was a lot of deer. Uh, I don't think before that they migrated much, but now, boy, if you get a little bit of snow and some cold weather, the deer are on the move. Mm-hmm. There's a big yard in Canada, and they they head right to Canada. So as soon as it starts getting nasty, they're out of there. They're out of there. Yeah. And uh, you know, it's something that the doe have been bred for and so on, and to survive, they they got to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, the bucks don't all necessarily move out when the does do, but it's just a matter of time before they pick up the trail where they've gone. Mm-hmm. Kind of like you were saying, I mean, they kind of wiped out all the deer yards. Yeah, the deer yeah yards, well, they've so. cut so much softwood. They didn't used to have to go to the yards yeah. because they could find enough shelter. They could hang around a lot longer. Yeah. A lot yeah. longer. Yeah. But now they, they got to go. And after yeah. they had that huge die off, I think they said they lost 70% of the deer herd in that area. That's how much it was up there? Yeah. Oh, wow. I remember hearing about the big die-off in like 2008 or whatever it yeah. was. Guys plowing the roads would have to plow them out of the road in the, in the morning because so many died in the road. Just come to the road and drop yeah. dead? Yeah. Like Dying or dead. Yeah. Get out into the road. They were plowing live deer out of the road some out. mornings. No kidding. Just because it was so harsh and just no yeah. food? or Yeah. Well, they hadn't they and, hadn't migrated and they got out and the going was so tough and they got out into the plowed roads and, and that was it and they died right there. And he guy said he every morning he'd plow deer dead deer out of the road to get in there so the trucks could get in haul all timber what a waste that's yeah. terrible nature's cruel though oh nature's yeah cruel Jeez. well do you guys want to dive into some deer stories you guys sure. ready for that yeah who yeah. uh who got out of the, you three boys who got the first 200 pounder out of camp uh gary did gary yeah. you want to start off with that story gary sure sure let's hear it um First, we have to back up just a little bit, though. Absolutely. When, the, the first year we hunted up in the area we are now, there was one road punched in that was so rough that we called it the puker. You could, you, you really, literally get sick driving out it. That really out bad. that road, there was so many softwoods, and the forest was so mature that it was like moss on the ground underneath the trees, and you could literally track deer through the moss, but you couldn't see the daylight. There, yep. was, there was no daylight getting in there at all. 
Mm-hmm. So it went from that to you could drive down that road and you could look down several hundred yards to a flowage and see the water trickling down. So it was pretty crazy. But so back in the early days, the first year we went to the Spencer's, Kenny shot that uh, 191 pound buck. And then uh, the next year, our brother-in-law shot at a, a giant buck over in that softwood patch and didn't get it. And then the, the third year, 1982, uh, 80, excuse me, 83, we hunted up in an area and it was bare ground. And it was the first part of the season. It might even have been the first Monday. I'm not sure. But um, we decided to hunt a ridge out through a ridge just above the transition woods. I was above the transition woods. Kenny was right down tight to the transition woods. And so we we're just working our way out through the hardwoods um, on this ridge, trying to see if we could locate some deer. Well, we looked down to the right and we we're, we're probably a hundred yards apart at that point in time. And I, I looked down to the right and I saw a deer go down over the bank down in front of Kenny. And he looked at me and he motioned for me to come down. So we went down and, and uh, he said, did you see that deer? And I said, well, I saw the back end of it when it went down over the bank. And he said, well, that's all I saw. But he said, it was a big back end. He said, I think it was a big deer. So I said, well, let's go over and see if we can see where it went down through. So again, this is on bare ground, but we, we worked our way down there and it had gone over the bank right down into the swamp. And we started down over the bank and sure enough, here's this big buck track right in, in the mud going down through. So we worked our way down through there on the tracks and it was kind of a deer trail going down through there. And, um, we got to the, the brook or they call it the, uh, river, but it's a, it's a, a bigger brook. And so we looked down in the brook and Kenny said, well, he said, he went across here somewhere. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, I'm going to jump over to the other side and we'll work our way over. And I looked down and the, the water was like five feet deep there. And I said, well, you, you better not jump over across that brook with your gun in your hand. You're going to end up in a drink anyway. So I said, give me your gun. So he handed me his gun. He jumped across the brook and he just about made it. And when he clawed his way up onto the bank on the other side, up jumps this buck 30 to 40 yards from him with a rack, you know, almost 24 inches wide. And he hollered at me, he said, give me my, and I had already tossed his gun after to him across the brook. And I had, I already had leveled down on the deer and I started wailing away at it. And uh, the first shot I took, I knocked it down partially. And then it was nothing but him and I were trimming alders for the next eight or 10 shots. Yep. And uh, it went up in through the alders and, it crossed the brook and I shot at it again and didn't hit it. So then the chase was on. We decided we were going to go after it. And we looked and sure enough, there was hair and blood on, on the bare ground. And we were able to track, follow the blood. You know, I was bleeding well enough. So, well, we took it for, I don't know. It was in the afternoon when I shot at it the first time. And then we got over into the swamp and jumped it. And I shot at him again and didn't hit him. And so we ended up, it was just about dark, and that year I had had a I messed up my back at work, and so I'd been out on disability for a while, and I was getting ready to rehabilitate my way back into work. So the doctor told me I could walk on uneven ground and carry twelve to fifteen pounds. So that was perfect for deer hunting. Yeah. So anyway, we got to an old skid road, and Kenny looked at me and he said, "We got to make a decision." He said we either got to plan on spending the night in the woods. Or we got to mark the trail and leave this deer. And I said, there's no way I can spend a night in the woods. I can hardly walk at this point. So we decided we'd better head out. Well, heading out was walking down that old skid road for about three and a half miles. And we got to the, we got to the main road where we drove up in. And it was probably, I don't know, somewhere between 530 and 6 o'clock. Been pitch black for I don't know how long. And we were five, five, five miles, miles back to the truck from there. Five miles from the camper. The camper, yeah. So, and so uh, I laid down in the road and I said, I can't go any further. And Kenny said, well, you better get out of the road because somebody's going to run you over. So anyway, we um, we saw a vehicle lights going. So Kenny fired a shot. And thank God it was Jimmy. They'd heard all the shooting and they were out looking for us. So he was out driving. So he came down and rescued us. And we said, well, we marked the trail. We'll go back in in the morning. So we slept 
that night and got up, you know, and headed out at daylight back up that three and a half miles up that skid road. And uh, we got about halfway up through there and a deer jumps out of the road, stands in the brush and the four of us standing there with our guns up, never touched off a shot because we couldn't see antlers. Walked up there and here's a giant scrape right in the middle of the road with a track in it bigger than the one we had shot at. Ugh. So we said, well, that one got away. Anyway, so we went in and we got within sight of the ribbons that we put up and we saw some ravens go up. So we said, oh, that's a good sign. So we went over there and that deer died within, I don't know, 75 yards from where it crossed that skid road. Mm -hmm. And it was laying there looking back at track and it was still warm. You know, it hadn't been dead for that long. So yep. then proceeded to get it out of there. And that one is, uh, is the one on the right hand wall. It's a 12 pointer. And it, it, uh, it dressed out at 213 mm -hmm. and it has five broken points on one side where it's been fighting. Oh, fighter. Jeez. It was yeah. probably that one we jumped out of the road when we were going in <laughs> yeah. and it was fighting with. Yeah. It could have been because that sure was a big bodied deer, but nobody could see antlers on it in the brush. So, mm -hmm. so that was 1982. That was the first, uh, that was the first buck that we, uh, 200 pounder that we got up there. Yeah, that's a beauty. That's a good way to kick it off, too. And I know Kenny was telling me a little bit about this story when I was down here last week. And you got to go back to what it looked like in the brook there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so so when, when the shooting when the shooting stopped and the deer was out of sight, Kenny looked down in the brook and he said, come here, look at this sheep. And I walked over there and it looked like a pile of gold in the bottom of the brook. There were so many empty casings in the brook. But I was I shot five times at it. Five times at it running, put my second clip in, shot at it once going across the road and once more in the swamp. And I think Kenny shot four times at it, right? Yeah, I think it was four. We oh, had like 11 or 12 shots at that deer and uh, it was worth every one of them. Yeah. But it was, it was just, it was comical because you wished that if we could have only had a camera and filmed that, nobody would, <laughs> nobody's going to believe the story. But I mean, literally, he hollered at me, "Give me my gun!" And I was already coming at him. It was a good thing he was ready for it. <laughs> if I knew I couldn't shoot that deer with two guns in my hand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a heck well, of a story. That's awesome. So, you, Jim, you must. So, you guys heard all the shooting. We heard all. We were on a, a different ridge up high, and yeah, we heard all the shooting. It sounded like a war down there, and so I guess they saw something. You knew it was no, it was them yes, at that point. We probably. knew it was them because there was nobody else in there. Yep. Back then, you know we were the only guys in there just about mm -hmm. there were a couple other ones well you pr might you probably knew the berniers yep. ricky bernier yeah. and them yeah they were up in there nice. some yeah uh then i don't know if it was that year or it was the yeah. first year or whatever but we we were up in there before they were but yeah, we they didn't run come into up them. in here till like 84 or 85 yeah, yeah something like that six yep. 86 maybe yeah because it was 85 was the year that jay got the big deer jay and i yeah 86 no, that was 85, because that was the year we couldn't hunt there. Yeah. Because they were logging. Yeah, you're right. You're right. That was the first year we camped in the pit. Yeah. Mm. So, 85, I know you were telling me about this story. Yeah. Last, you might as well go right into um, that, I don't Jay. think we got one up until that point, another 200-pounder, but. No. Yeah, we did. Because we had Leroy, the second. The, oh, that's the year right. That, that's, that'd be the next one. That was 84, yeah. yeah. And that's a, that's quite so a story. better that. tell that story? Yeah, go for it, Ken. We uh, got up in the morning. <clears throat> we were staying in the camper, and we decided that we were going to go down try a different area. So we drove down the road, and as we're driving down the road, there's about six inches of fresh, wet snow, and the sun was coming up. It was a perfect day for tracking. And here's some tracks in the road. And we got out and looked and said, oh, my God, look at that deer track. That's the biggest deer track we had seen. He said, well, I guess we better follow this. So we started, we parked the blazer and got out, and the three of us started out through the woods. And I don't know, one guy taking the track and the other two guys on either side. And we started, went out through, and it turned and come back out into the road. And when it come back into the road, there was another pickup coming up. And these guys were checking the track. And I said, hey, he said, we're already on this, guys. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. So... They left, and we turned and followed. The deer went back down in the woods, in the swamp, and so we commenced to follow them. And we followed the deer over, I don't know, three ridges or something like that. It was late in the afternoon. We hadn't seen it yet. And 
we got going. We come down into some hardwoods, and all of a sudden, here's a boot track comes up over the up over the ridge, and takes our deer track. I said, "Well, shit, uh-huh. what are we gonna do now?" I said, "Well, we're gonna have to. There's no sense of hanging around here because this other hunter is on the on the deer track. So we might as well head back for the blazer." Uh-huh. So we went cross country and headed back to the blazer, and said, "Well." I said to the guys, I said, tomorrow we're going to go for a ride and we're going to find out where the hell that guy come in from Mm -hmm. because we hadn't crossed a road. So we did that. The next morning we got up and we drove down the road about six or seven miles and we found a road that cut up in there and we drove to the end of it and parked and uh, headed up in the woods and we got up into the hardwoods and started going and boom, here's this big deer track. And there was no mistake in it. It was the biggest deer track in the woods that year. Mm. I don't know if I've ever seen a deer track any bigger than what that one Just was. Just a giant foot on he it. Was, he had big feet. Mm-hmm. I, I got to interrupt you for a minute, Kenny, because I got to get the backstory here for you. The week before, Kenny and I were hunting over in this area, and we didn't realize it the night before when we tracked the deer over in there, how close we were to where we'd hunted the week before, because it was so far away, you know, and so many ridges over. Well... We were in there, and it was a rainy, foggy day, so I had my gun with a peep sight, and we got into this area, and all of a sudden, this deer started blowing at me, and I looked, and I could see the deer. His head was behind a tree about 60, 80 yards from me, and that deer, you know how a deer will blow at you and run once or twice. Sometimes they blow two or three times. This one blew 50 times at me, and it would not leave, and I had the body right there. I had the I had the peep sight right on it. You know the orange bead. I could pull the trigger anytime I wanted, but I couldn't see antlers on it. And all of a sudden, I I, de- I decided to make a step to the right so I could see if I could get a look at antlers. And I moved, and the deer whirled and took off. Hmm. Well, this is in the same area where the next week on snow we tracked this deer over into. So then I'll let, I'll let Kenny continue with his story now because I never got to stop that deer. <laughs> But I did get a look at it, and it was probably a 180 to 190 pound eight pointer. That's a good one. So we uh, <coughs> we went out through. And and we, we called him Wheezy. Yeah, Wheezy. <coughs> we uh, split up, and we each took a track. But the deer was chasing a doe, and he'd spent all night going up and down the ridge, and there was so many sets of tracks, we couldn't determine which was the freshest. So as I went to the top of the ridge, I decided this is fruitless. So I headed back down over to the lowlands, and as I was coming down the hill, I picked up a small buck track, coming down off by himself, headed down into the greens. So it wasn't too long after that that I ran into Gary, and I said, hey, I said, "Uh, we can't determine where that big buck has gone. He's been so many miles in here last night that, you know, we might as well forget about that. So I said, let's take that smaller buck I said he's by himself and he's headed down into the greens and we'll see what happens so he said yeah okay so we headed down maybe it's my wheezy buck yeah (laughs) we headed down out of the out of the hardwood into the greens and we hadn't gone I don't think we'd gone four or five hundred yards out through there and we jumped that deer in the meantime I was work doing a loop up above him so I was up on the top of the ridge and I started coming back down the ridge and continue on so we we went out through and that we jumped that buck up and he went out through and he jumped a big buck in a doe so they turned and headed back for the hardwoods ridge and gary and i went up through there and we come out through and we caught them standing all three of them standing there and the smaller buck that eight pointer made one jump and he was out of sight we couldn't get a good look at him but the big buck in the doe were kind of across the ravine across from us oh it was probably 100 125 yards or so and the doe was ahead of the buck and he lowered his antlers and give her a shot in the ass end and picked her hind end about four feet right in the no air kidding. they said lady you got to get going yeah so they started and once she got clear gary and i opened up on him and uh he shot once or twice and i shot a couple times and finally i shot again and he said you hit him I said, well, what do you mean? I said, I couldn't tell I hit him. He said, well, he said, I was just getting ready to pull the trigger on it, and he rolled right up. When you fired, he rolled right up in my scope. He said, I could see white, see the whole belly. 
Hmm. And I said, well, I, I must have got close. And again, in the meantime, I was kneeling down because they were so close to me that <laughs> I thought they were shooting at me. Like a war going on. Yeah. <laughs> so we went There was over a bit of a war going on at that point. <laughs> so we went on, went over across and took the track and went out through. When he didn't go, I don't think he went 50, 75 yards, and we found him dead. And he had one shot up through the back end up into the boiler works. Old Texas heart shot or what? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It's effective. Yeah. Huh. It works. I I got to tell you the story a little bit further, though, because, you know, Kenny and I have shot three 200-pounders together, um, both of us shooting at the bucks and all tracking all three of them. And um, But Kenny likes to do the play-by-play while we're shooting. So we're in the <laughs> middle of this giant buck is going out through the hardwoods, and we've already shot four or five times, and he goes, we haven't hit, we haven't hit him yet. And I'm like, well, <laughs> yeah. I, I could tell by the, the way he's going, and we shoot two or three more times, and he goes, well, I can't hit him. And, and it's like, yeah, well, neither can I, apparently, because he hadn't fallen down yet. So I'm getting to play-by-play the whole time. He's, this deer's going out through there, and it's like, uh, okay, well, finally, when he made that, the lethal shot, I like, I like he said, I could see the whole deer roll up, and I saw the hole underneath of the deer. When he pulled it the yeah, so I knew, that he, I knew that he punched it. I was close well, enough got, to them when I when I started down the hill. I got to the deer before they did. Oh, you did? <laughs> He's dead at that yeah. point. Yeah, yeah, nice. And he, the deer was still had his head up when we got there, but he didn't last long. Yep, yep. Yeah, it's an effective shot if you hit it right. Yes. Jeez. So what that deer weigh? Two thirty five. That was the two thirty five. Yeah, that's a tank of a buck. Jeez. Yeah. What do you have for a rack on it? Eight point. Was that is that one of the ones on the yes. wall there? Okay, yeah. got you. Yep. Yeah. We'll have scored, to put a uh, that's the only buck I ever had scored, and that was uh green. It was one thirty nine and five eights. Yep. So with, with all three of you guys right there walking up on a big dead buck like that, you guys the celebration must have started right then. Just yeah, about, yeah, it? Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. But we you knew we had the, a drag to get it yeah. wasn't bad from that way because we knew where that road was then. Yeah. Yeah. It was all but, downhill. Yeah. It was a good drag. Nice. Yeah. Can't beat that. So your back must have been healed up at this point, Gary. So you're on drag duty oh. then. I was in good shape that year. I yeah. was not in good shape the year before when I shot that one. Yeah. I shot two deer that year. I shot that one in Maine, and I shot one when we came back in Vermont, and I never dragged an inch on either of them. <laughs> I had I had good help. Yeah, good brothers <laughs> right there. Yep. Can't beat that. So, what was, did you have something? I thought you were going to say something. Sorry. No. Um, so, after that, 1985, 1985 is the 250. We could hunt in the area that we were in. So we had found a way to get around and come in from a from the other end. Yep. Um, some roads went up in from up toward the border more, and you were a, we were able to get into the the roads we had hunted before, mm-hmm. all up in there. That puker road that we called it I there. I like that puker road. Yeah. <laughs> but we could come in from the other end and hit the far end of it. Mm. And so we we decided we were going to go up in there and hunt, and it, it was just a huge clear cut that they just put in up there. So we drove up as far as we could drive, and again, we had its blazer, and all of us, all four of us were in just one vehicle. So him and Gary went one way, and Jay, my brother-in-law, and I went the other way. Up, up, We started up the road above the where the blazer was parked, and we had hit a smoking fresh track across the road up there in fresh snow. So then we made a huge loop on that. We took him, and he made a big loop. <laughs> down around and then back up and crossed right in sight of the blazer. Uh, that was that was probably the first two hours of the morning. Yep. And uh, so, anyways, we, we went out into that big clear cut, and it, it this clear cut was probably a fifteen acre clear cut or better. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we went out across. The, he went straight across, and then we got out there to that point and he made a 90 degree turn and when we made that 90 degree turn we looked down the the hill probably 250 to 300 yards and he was standing there looking over his shoulder back up to his back track and so and you could see his rack sticking up there no No. and so my brother-in-law jay said there he is and he pulled up and he took the first shot and i stepped off a little bit to the right and i pulled up and I was holding, he put his tail up and started to go after he shot. And I, I was holding the top of his tail because I figured it was that far away. Mm-hmm. And we, I shot, I think, twice, and he shot a couple more times or whatever. And uh, so then we hustled down there. 
and started looking at the tracks and we found blood and hair. So I said, you must've hit him the first shot, Jay. And so then we, we were pumped, really pumped up then. So he, we get down there and uh, he gets on the tracks and there was this big skitter rut where they log, you know, at that edge of that clear cut with a forwarder mm -hmm. or whatever. And get he got across that before I did. And so he was a little bit ahead of me on that, that rut and he went around the corner and the deer, the buck was standing there looking at him again because he didn't know what was going on. Mm -hmm. and we were so far away. And then uh, he got another shot into him there. And then the chase was really on. Yep, hit him good that time. He hit him pretty good that time. So he was bleeding good. And he was only going maybe 100, 150 yards and he'd lay down. Mm -hmm. Hurt real bad then. He was hurt pretty bad, but it was really started to snow at that point. It was like a blizzard, big, huge flakes. Mm -hmm. And it was hard to see out through there. So he and Jay was going pretty fast at that point because he was pumped up. You yeah. know, oh, he I knew bet. how yeah. big the buck was. Yeah. yeah. And he was going out through there and, and he kept jumping it up. But because of the snow and everything, you couldn't see it quick enough. You couldn't see him laying there. Mm -hmm. And uh, he'd come up and you'd see him come up and we'd fire once or twice more at him. I think we ended up shooting 13 times before we got him down. So you guys are no strangers to shooting up. No, there. no, no. <laughs> so anyways, we, we finally got out there and he was hurting bad enough so that the last hurrah there, he went out and he was just standing there. And we got he got a standing still shot and yep. dropped him there. And then we got up there and looked at it and he said, geez, this is, this is a big deer. Yeah. It was a 10 pointer. Yeah. And, uh, when we weighed that one, it was 258 pounds. That's crazy. Did, what were you guys thinking when you walked up to it as far as body wise? I mean, oh, it was, it was just a huge, giant deer. Yeah. yeah. So, and it, I have pictures of it and, and it, it was just barely dead and it was covered with snow already. That's how hard it's it was coming snowing. Down. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was a and blizzard. Yeah. So back in that, that time we, we had these walkie talkies that you had to pull out of like a six foot antenna <laughs> CD <laughs> radios. Yeah. And uh, so we could, we, those guys heard us shooting, so they were listening. And we got on the radio and said, Hey, we're going to need some help down here. And they were on a buck at the same time. And uh, so they had to leave that and, and come help us. And um, Jay and I tried dragging it, and we'd take the guns out, you know, 100 yards or so, 50 yards, mm -hmm. and lean them up against the tree and go back and drag the deer to that point and do it again. Yeah. And we did that a few times, and we were pretty well spent. I mean, there was a good foot of snow there, probably. Yep. Even with the snow, he's dragging real hard. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. He knew he's yeah. a giant. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so these guys finally showed up, and we we did a four-man hitch on it. We had two back near the antlers and two up front with a longer rope mm -hmm. with sticks, you know. Yep. So all four of us were dragging at the same time. Mm -hmm. And we got him out, and uh, we get out there, and where the road was that we parked, this other truck was coming up in. It was from New Hampshire, I think they were from. Yeah. But we get coming up there, and these guys jump out, and, and they, they say, hold on, hold on, hold on. We got to take some pictures of this. Our wives <laughs> don't believe that this is work. <laughs> you know, they think we're up here goofing off. Yeah. And here we come with the four guys up over the, yeah. the pile of the road, into the road, and they helped us take it the rest of the way and load it on top of the blazer. Nice. Yeah, so, that's probably a chore getting a two hundred and fifty something pound yeah. buck up on top yeah. of the blazer. Yeah, you got your hands full. It was. Yeah. We were glad for their help. Were you guys <laughs> picking them up? Or were you like ho pulling a, a rope and hoisting them up over a tree, or what were you guys doing? Oh, uh, we just just muscled them up. Bunch of guys up on yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. muscled them onto the tailgate and then up on after that. Yeah, yeah. We were much younger and stronger then. Yeah, yeah. but that was the that's the heaviest buck we've ever gotten up there. Mm -hmm. We the next next one was that's down the road quite a ways, but. That must have been one of the heaviest bucks of that year, though. If it's it's got to be top five. If they not. were getting a lot of deer back that that time. You know, they were in the two sixties, two seventies. Yeah, I don't think that one even made the top twenty five. Really, back then. Yeah. yeah. Now yeah. if you yeah. shoot a, a two fifty, two sixty, yeah. you're in the top yeah. running. I yeah. think the big the yeah. biggest one this year was like two sixty nine. Yeah, something. I saw that. Yeah. yeah. Nice but that was yeah. two fifty eight. So you know, and that was hog dressed. Yep. Yep. Would you guys hang them? So would you guys? 
load them up and then drive to Jackman or wherever you report them? Or would you hang them at camp for a few days and then? No, we usually took them in and got them reported. And yeah. you had to go to Rockwood back then to report them. Oh, okay. Then hang them. Yeah, yeah. Because the farm hadn't reopened yet. Mm, okay, gotcha. Yeah, that's a great buck. Uh, did you? Sh- uh, yeah, you showed me a picture of that one. Yes. Yeah, big ten pointer. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. I'll never forget that story. Yeah. So, so what- then, uh, I don't know what's next on the buck list, but keep on chipping away. Whatever one you guys got. The one that you guys that, uh, <laughs> up from Duffy Lane there, and yeah, know, that's a pretty good end, story. That's a good story. <laughs> you can we, tell uh, that one, Gary. Uh, yeah that that was the. Uh, I, I did the 10 deer, 10 days challenge, and I wrote about this one. Uh, we called it the no deer here deer. Hmm. We were we went up this road off the main road. It's kind of in a V. And so we went up the up this side road, and we decided we were going to hunt up onto the ridge from there. Kenny and myself and another guy that was had joined us from, he was from Maine. And so um, we, we spread out up the road, and we started hunting. You know, it was bare ground. Uh, no, excuse me. There was there was some snow on the ground, but it was crunchy snow. It was froze up. It was really crunchy. So we started up through there, and I was on the lower end. Kenny was in the middle, and this other guy was to the right of Kenny. And and uh, we got I don't know how far did we get Kenny? Maybe four hundred yards. Yeah, thereabouts. And, and here comes the guy back down the the hill, and he. So we went, we kind of went over together. And I had just got into the edge of the transition woods where it was some softwoods mixed in with hardwoods, mm-hmm. and it was loaded with deer tracks. I mean, it was like a highway. And so this guy comes down, he goes, I've been all the way to the top, and there's not a deer anywhere up here. There's no sign or nothing. Mm-hmm. And Kenny looked at me, and I looked at him, and because we just barely got into the sign. He said, I'm going back down the road and going to the lower side, whatever. So, okay, have fun. So Kenny said, did you just get into a bunch of deer sign? And I said, oh, yes, I did. I said, come with me. So we went up over the hill, and there was like a, a softwood. I guess it was mixed softwood, hardwood, but it was kind of a flat, and it was probably as big as, uh, oh, maybe maybe not even the size of a football field, but, you know, pretty good size. Mm-hmm. And there was so many scrapes on that flat. I, I don't even know if we could count them all. That that buck had been up there, and he had ripped up trees, and he had the ground ripped up, and it was it was ripped up right to the ground, and it was probably what four six inches of snow on the ground, right, Ken? Yeah, I would say. And so, Kenny looked at me, and and you could smell the deer urine in the air, and it was like it was so. I mean, he, that buck had been rutting so hard, he freshened those scrapes within the last hour. Yeah. And so, Kenny said, "We got to find out where the, you know, where the uh, the freshest track is." So we started looking and we went about 60 yards and he said, I think this is the freshest track. So we started tracking the deer and he kind of went down over a hill and there was, there was kind of a a cut road up through there and it it transitioned down into the, down into the other road. And it, it was a kind of a swampy area down in there. Well, all of a sudden he stepped over on the side and he planted his foot and his gun came up and he went, and I was like, Oh boy, something big's coming. And so I stepped off to the side a little bit, and here comes this buck running right up through the berry bushes. And every time he jumps up, we can see this big rack and this giant body. And he hits the ground, and he's almost out of sight. Well, the good news is he's only 50 yards away from us. And he's getting closer as he's coming up the hill. So he got out into the open, and the shooting commenced. And, and uh, he, he, then he got out of sight. And um, we dropped him twice. He went right on his belly twice. Yep. And so I'm like, well, he hit pretty good. And, and I looked up and here goes Kenny running up over the hill. And he's now he's, I'm like, where the hell is he going? The deer's down here. And little did I know that he was running up over the hill because it's wide open clear cut up there. And he thought the deer was going to get into the clear cut and he could get a shot at it. Mm. So I, well, I'm going down here and find out, you know, obviously we hit the deer. They don't fall down on your chest twice yep. without hitting them. So, <clears throat> We, uh, I got down there and I started on the first track and I'm like, well, there's no hair or blood here. And I said, oh, I'm probably in one of his old tracks. So I went down a little further. Sure enough, the track was fresher. I went maybe 10 yards and here's a pile of hair and blood all over the snow. And I went another 10 yards and here's another pile of hair and blood on the snow. And I said, yeah, we hit him twice. And so I 
started up through, and I could see Kenny up in the clear cut. And he's he's like, where'd he go? Where'd he go? And I'm, well, I don't know. I'm on his track. And, and there was a lot of blood. And then it was about a six or eight inch beech tree. And it was painted from four feet to the ground with blood. Oh, wow. And I'm like, I'm like, huh, that's kind of odd. And so I got up there and I looked and the deer had run right smack into that tree. And he had done an almost a 90 degree turn to the right. And he was piled up under a top. And wow. you couldn't even see him. I mean, you could, you could barely see him, but he was there. Slid so I went and he got him to come down and, and, uh, he came down and he goes, he goes, wow. He goes, I knew he was big, but I didn't know he was this big. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, that's a good one. That was the eight pointer that was dressed out 226. Kenny, I think. Yeah. That, uh, that by that time I had made it over there cause I heard all the shooting and, uh, I made it over there and, and, and we got over there and got gathered up and I looked down. And I can see the truck parked. Oh, no kidding. Um, yeah, right there, there was a culvert out that year yeah. on that road that mm -hmm. went up down below. And uh, we had parked the truck right there where the culvert was out. Mm -hmm. And when when we got to the deer and got ready to start dragging, I looked down and I said, we can, we can see the truck right there. Let's get him right down the hill. Yeah, we, so it was like what, f four or 500 yards maybe, but yeah. it was all downhill and all open nice on snow on cool. snow can't beat that no take the easy ones when you can get them right yeah so what was that yeah. buck doing up there was there was there a group of does living on that flat or is he just i don't know but he was or running or up and down that hill there was a hot one there somewhere and he yeah he'd hooked up more stuff and the ground was all tore up i don't know if i'd ever seen a place that had been worked up as much as what that was really through yeah. the snow just dirt flying yeah. everywhere just, and yeah, oh, yeah he just had pawed he had all over the place and and they were they were opened up. They weren't just a little bit of where you know you see the hooks and the yeah. dirt flew a little bit. These are ripped up to the ground and they're ten feet in diameter. No, and they're all over that hill. So and he I was mean, pissed he off. Was, oh yeah, he was he worked was, up. Yeah, yeah. And across the road where the truck was parked, across that road, um, down the other side is a big swamp. And I think he was going right back and forth checking those, you know, whatever. But that was his home territory, and we just stumbled right onto it, and it was like. And, you know, from the time we took the track to when we shot the deer, it wasn't 20 minutes. Yep. So when you guys caught him, he was coming back up to that shelf? He was shelf. coming back up. So yeah. just back and yeah. forth, back checking, and looking forth. for does. Yeah. Up and down, up and down. Must have been, a, like yeah. you said, hot dough right yeah. there somewhere in that area. And it was probably six or eight sets of tracks where he'd come up and down. No and, kidding. I mean, he literally was checking that every hour, it seemed like. But, uh, yeah, that one was really, he was really uh, rutting hard. Yeah. Probably the, probably the hardest I've ever seen a buck run no oh, wow so that guy that was in there just before you did he just go way up above it or was he I, i'm not sure what he or did was he trying but he, to do a little deception there he just went to he said well i've been to the top of the hill and there ain't nothing there so i'm out of here so it's gary and i no, said he, well we're we're gonna go we're gonna keep going yeah so that's a hunt okay. well i just got into the tracks you know where we were seeing tracks and we hadn't seen that buck track yet I mean, I just had got into where the deer were, probably where the does were back and forth in there, feeding out in the clear cut and stuff. And I was kind of on the edge of it. And, and so if you were two, 300 yards to the right, you probably would have missed any of that stuff, you know, because they were kind of hanging more into that transition wood, you know, the hardwood, softwood mix. Mm -hmm. yep. so well, he liked to go a lot faster than we did anyway. Yeah. So that he, he had gone over and come back, but it, well, it took us to get down to the bottom of the hill. Yep. Before we started up, mm -hmm. I know before, before to not to get off topic, I know you were just talking about that buck tearing up trees and everything. Last time we talked last week, you were saying the amount of signpost rubs back then was it just a crazy amount more than all it is along now? the flowage there? Yeah, park the camper. Yeah, yeah. I go. mean we we still find quite a few of them, but uh, it seemed like back in them days, of course, the woods have changed a lot because they've logged so many times, and it seemed like. Back in the old days, uh, some of the transition was closer to the brooks and so on, and they, mm -hmm. they seemed to be more, you know, rubs and stuff down in that area than what, what we big find now. Big cedars that were big rubbed. rubbing big cedar trees. Yeah. 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 You don't see that too often. It's a lot of brown ash I see them on up there. Yeah. And I've seen it on some uh, <clears throat> some uh, birch, uh, beech trees, yeah. you know, on those. But yeah. I was just curious. In the early days, there was a – there was – uh, a signpost rub up what we call Burley Bill's Trail, where Max liked to go up an old skid road. And uh, right at the top of it, where it broke down into the hardwoods on the backside, there was a beech tree there that was just hammered year after year after year. Mm -hmm. nice. Greg found one uh, 
I think it was two years ago, and it they'd rubbed on it so much that it had weakened it, and it had fallen over, and they were still hitting it when it was laid oh, down. Oh, horizontal? Yeah. Well, still hitting it? Yeah. Nice. They was fresh, uh, fresh place. He went and checked it this past fall, and they were still hitting it. Yeah. And it had fallen over a year ago. Pretty amazing when those bucks get some age, how they they come back to those rubs year after year after year. Yeah. And you don't see that in Vermont much. No. <laughs> so, Gary, you should probably tell your golf tee buck there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, the yeah. one down by uh, the tree stand there. That was the next yeah. one we come across the flowage there. Yeah. We um we hunted the, over in this uh, area. It was kind of a clear-cut area when we first started getting in there. And it was an old couple. And we called them bro and sis. They were, you know, now brother and sister. They probably were younger than we are now. But they, back then, they were older, and they they had tree stands down in there. So we called it Bro's Tree Stand Road, and we'd hunt down in this area. So anyway, uh, first week of the season on bare ground, one of our good friends Ed Severance was uh, hunting with us, and he shot at a monster buck. Him and him and another guy, Kevin. Um, shot at a monster buck over in the bro's tree stand clear cut and he said we got to get back there on snow because this thing is a monster and so we said okay that that's good so we'll we'll hunt it so this particular day we had some pretty good snow on the ground and we said let's uh a little bit of snow on the ground and the weather was calling for snow so we said well let's surround that area and we'll go hunt it so my brother-in-law and i went down to the end of this other cut road and we worked from I guess that would be from the east, right? And we headed west, sort of over into that area. The other guys all came over the ridge from the other side, and it's the ridge that we call Locomo Ridge because that's where that big Locomo skitter was. Yep. And so they came over Locomo Ridge down in, and we kind of met down in the pocket in the bottom where Eddie had shot at that deer. That was the plan anyway. And so when my brother-in-law and I started out through the swamp, we we were coming over through, and we kept jumping deer and, and I could see, I could see the legs going and I couldn't see the body good because it was thick down in there. And so when I came out of the, the swamp, sort of in the edge of the clear cut, it just started to let down snow and it was snowing like those half dollar size flakes. And they were, it was coming down and it was, the sky was black and you know, it just, it was dark almost because it was snowing so hard. Mm -hmm. So I cut to the right a little bit and I saw this orange going out through the, the softwoods and that was that friend of ours from maine was going right through the middle of the softwoods down there and he was going about 120 miles an hour so i said well there's no sense of me going there so i cut to the right and i got to the end of a, a log header that came in from the north and and i kind of was up on the edge of that log header and i started down in back toward the the clear cut a little bit and all of a sudden i could hear antlers coming and smashing through the alders and through the brush. And it was like this big, giant ghost went by me at about 50 yards away. Hmm. And I could see the antlers beating off the trees, but there was no way to get a bullet to it. It was just going. Hmm. And it was grunting like a pig. It, it, I mean, the deer were grunting so bad, there was three different bucks in there. And they were chasing a hot doe. And they were just, <laughs> and they were going and running. And the antlers were smashing off the brush. And, and I'm... A dying because I can't get a shot at this buck and I know he's a giant and all of a sudden this buck comes right out of the brush I could hear him smashing and it was the second of the three bucks came running right out to me and he stopped behind a spruce tree and he picked his head up and he grunted at me well he's got a um 11 point rack it's 22 inches wide 22 inches inside <laughs> and he stuck his head up and I said good enough pal I shot him right below the white patch yep and he went down, he started thrashing around. So I ran over and shot him again. There might have been some hollering going on <laughs> at that point in time. I was a little bit wound. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, that one, he's he's got 11 points. And on the right hand beam, he's got three points that come together. And you could literally set a golf ball in it and hold it. I'd see, I'd see a picture of that one. I got to see that. Yeah. Yeah. No so I, I thought Jim ate some video, and that one's in the video. Yeah. And um, he, he dressed out. Uh, 232 pounds, Jeez. and he was the smaller of the three bucks. The uh, he, was, he was the smaller of the first, the two biggest ones. The wow. first one that went by me was probably the one Eddie shot at. 
Mm. And he, Eddie came over and they helped us get it out. And he looked at it and he said, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but he said, the one I shot at, you can put that set of antlers right inside of his. Really? I said, well, he was probably the first one I saw that I couldn't get a shot at. Yeah. And wow. uh, so anyway, that one, I had that one scored and he scored 157 points. Um, non-typical. They scored it non-typical because he's got, he's so unbalanced. He's yeah. got four points on one side and all the rest of the 11 are on the other side. Scored 157 and he's sitting inside the other one's rack. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Makes exactly. Wonder. Any wow. Other, the other one was every bit as big, if not bigger body wise. Yeah. When, when they run through in the brush, you can't really judge yeah. how big it is, but I just can tell you how big the rack was because it was beaten off the trees and it was like whackety, 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 whackety. I'm like, Oh my God, that's a giant buck. And that's he was incredible. grunting the whole time. And this one was grunting the whole time. And the third buck ran by Kenny twice with the doe. What was the third one? A small eight pointer. Yeah. So still not a bad buck. No, yeah. Yeah. no, you, you just shot it. Yeah. You, had the opportunity, but he yeah. was motoring when I see it. Yeah. That doe was hot then, huh? Oh, yeah. yeah. That's incredible. Oh, yeah. Three bucks on chasing one doe. I yeah. You don't see that. That was an awesome ridge there till they cut it for about the third time now. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's not the same. Dead zone now or? What's still, that? Dead zone now, you guys still have yeah, it. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's, it's, they're still there, but you gotta you get to walk a long ways to get there. <laughs> yeah. Cause they've shut their, they've pulled the bridges out and uh, stuff. I was gonna ask out of all these areas and stuff that you guys hunt. Have you ever gone back and killed a, a buck in the same area that you have prior? Yeah. 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 Close to. Yeah. 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 I shot another eight pointer down in the, in the edge of the swamp where we shot that 12 pointer years later after it'd been logged out again. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I shot an eight pointer in... down there that Gary chased to me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, we hit a patch there where it was the perfect tracking day and, uh, we had been up toward that other area where he shot that other deer and we got that back down to this area above where our old campsite was and it was tracks going every which way so he gary took a track and went down toward the brook and i went down below the where the old campsite was and they had logged down in there and there was a lot of old grassy skid roads down in there so i was started down one of the skid roads and he was coming along the the brook on that track and i happened to come down the skid road just at the right time and i had my gun down off my shoulder and all of a sudden this eight pointer comes out of the softwood all i see was the rack coming and he was motoring he had just gary had just jumped him back in there he got scared by a big guy (laughs) (laughs) and so he came out at full speed and I, I had to shoot him like a partridge. I had the scope on there, but I picked it up and I just got brown in the scope and touched one off. Yeah. And uh, so I get on the radio. We had good, pretty good radios then. And I ca- called Gary and I said, well, I think I got one hit down here. And he said, that was you that shot. He said, I couldn't even hardly hear that. <laughs> I was so shooting thin. away from oh, him. I was shooting away, yeah. And uh, down into the softwoods in the snow and it muffled the shot. You could barely, it, it sounded like to me, it was like a, a mile from me. Really? How far were you going, actually? We oh, probably weren't more than a hundred yards. Really? Just 150 just yards. Trees. I had just jumped the deer. He was, he was coming down through and he kept making like figure eights. He'd go back and forth, you know, zigzagging. Mm-hmm. He was looking for a place to lay down. And so I said, oh, I know this trick. So every time he went right, I went left around some thick stuff. And well, wouldn't you know, I went right, and then, then I and then I went left, and he went right out of his bed, and he was right behind some spruces, and I just heard him go, you know, and he was gone. I never did get a look at him; I could hear him going. Mm-hmm. And then a little while later, I heard that shot, and it's like, Oof. he just appeared out of the out of the greens, you know, popped right out, yeah, popped right out, and then it was all uh, alders and stuff, and he he zipped by me there, and I got it on his midsection you know center mass and i pulled the trigger and i got over there and i found hair and some blood and that's when i talked to him and said oh i got one leaking down here so i'll wait for you to come along and then we'll go track him down and as i was standing there he had made a loop around like and was paralleling back by me and i heard a death moan over there oh yeah. you know i said i yeah. think he's down right over here when gary got to me and we went around there and 
he wasn't 50 yards or 75 yards from where I shot. Yeah. Hit him good then. He, he was yeah, down. On, oh, yeah. On Punched good him pretty That's good. Hard. Yeah. That's not easy to do. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I'd always... I'd always told him about the death moan, and and when you shoot those big bucks, just before they expire, they'll let out that death moan, Mm -hmm. and that supposedly that's to alert the other bucks in territory that it's they're they're gone. You can take over the territory. Really? But I that's that's what I've been told. Be it truth or fiction, I don't know. But several of the bucks that I've shot, I've heard them do the death moan before they expired. You know, I was close enough to them, so when they expired, I could hear them. Yep. This wasn't a huge buck, but it was a nice, you know, I got a picture of that one. It's yep. nice. My first eight pointer, so nice. I had that head mounted. Nice. That's a good one. That's an interesting theory. I'd never heard that theory before about the death moan, but I kind of like it. That's, yeah. It's kind of got some mystique to it. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Well, I heard it plain as day because he was only through the woods from me. He was probably only 25, 30 yards. Yeah. But we, we had to sort of go around and then backtrack a little bit. And his head was still up when we got over there, but. Yeah. He was done. I was going to shoot much. him again, but yeah. I didn't need to. He keeled over there, and that was it. Nice. I got going back to what we were just talking about with some cutting and, and killing bucks in the same areas and stuff. One question for you guys, being that you got forty years, forty plus years up there, and you guys seen all sorts of logging up there. Oh yeah. Um, so in an area, say you kill a buck in, and then it gets completely clear cut or strip cut it out. How many years after do you see, you know, deer coming back into that area? I want to say three to four years. Three to when, four. When I, you start, I was going to say three to five years maximum. When you start getting new feed. growth and stuff in, you know, the, the feed is good for them. Yep. And of course, the moose are always ahead of the deer. Mm-hmm. They're in there stripping, but the, the deer the deer will come in. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So three to three to five years. Something like that. Yeah, once the berry bushes start coming and so on, and they'll, <clears throat> they'll come back in there. Yep. So once it starts getting like mm-hmm. stemmy and, and whips and stuff, the, they kind of pull out of it a little bit well no they they like if it's whippy they like it like this fall uh pretty near every bucket we shot at was in the whips hardwood whips and mm-hmm. boy i tell you it's tough to get a yeah get a bullet through some of that stuff and you guys did some shooting this year you were telling me right you guys shot at some bucks right we shot at seven different bucks seven different bucks yeah just in the don't ask stuff. him how many to hit <laughs> I, I, I i was told last <clears throat> time i was down here but, Jerry and I were yeah. like a couple of the only ones that didn't get a shot. <laughs> yeah. How many did you yeah. shoot at, Ken? Just one. Just one. I passed up a spike horn early, and then uh, I needed about a tenth of a second. I was just settling the crosshairs on his neck when it turned real quick, and I took a shot, and it was in the hardwood whips, and I had one shot, and that was it. Mm-hmm. Greg shot it too. Yeah, Greg, my son, shot it uh, two rack bucks, and he saw two other spikes it's still a good season though getting yeah. to pull the trigger like that yeah how many guys total this year do you have a camp i know dylan he was up there with you yeah, guys dylan for and avery and, yeah. were there and so how many guys total we had eight i think seven at one point yeah it was the most i think we had in there yeah we had another little wall tent that we set up for dylan and avery stayed in there and then one of our other guys that comes up stayed in there mm-hmm. after they left mm-hmm. so nice. the overflow yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. how many so since you know, the big die off in 2008, 2009. How many bucks have you guys taken since then? I've oh. got uh, three 200 pounders since then. Since, since the die-off. then, yeah. Nice. Greg's got two. Greg's got two, yeah. And uh, who else? Somebody else got one. Uh, Benway. Benway's got a couple, yeah. I see yeah. the picture you guys yeah. got in there. You were showing me of all of them on the game pole there. Was it what year was that in? 2018. That was a real good year. That's probably yeah. the best year that we've had. Well, take me into that year. I want to hear about it. I didn't get a buck that year. No, I was one Just of the only ones camp. that didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it was that was the year of the big snow there, and it started off snowing, and by the time we got done, like I said, it was up to your crotch, mm-hmm. so that they were migrating, and uh, we had a blind set up because at that point I had already had my first bout of cancer, and I couldn't walk mm-hmm. good, so we had a blind that I was sitting in. Or we didn't. We didn't have a blind we had that a year. Chair. We had a chair there. He just set up right. a folding chair. And uh, there was a game trail down below there that they were hitting pretty hard. So we uh, had actually uh, Rob. Yeah, but Eddie got his first, right? No. Oh yeah, yeah. He shot one. I Eddie think. shot one. His was a hundred and ninety pound eight pointer or, or whatever. Yeah. He yeah. shot uh, one of our good spots down below. And then Gary shot the second one. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. I got an eight pointer about 160. Yeah. Yep. Nice. And, uh, and I we, shot the wrong buck. Alan shot the wrong had got buck. his deer. He was the first one to get a deer, I think. Yeah. He wasn't, he wasn't staying with us, but they were staying right near us. Right next door. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And then, so he got that. And then, then, uh, Rob, we, we have this spot we call Rob's knob now. Cause he, he went up there and sat in the chair and, uh, seven o'clock in the morning, Eddie had already had his deer. So he drove him up and dropped him off before he could get back down to the tent, which was like a mile and a half, two miles up the road. Um, Rob had called and said, I got my buck. <laughs> Can't be so, had the radio on in the tent because I had got, I yeah. had my buck already. Too, yeah. So, yeah. So the guys were hanging out at the tent and, and man in the trucks if we needed a ride, you know? So, yeah. so anyway, Eddie went, uh, he comes down, pulls in the yard and I said, you need to go back and get Rob. He says, how come? I said, he's already got his deer. <laughs> so, and so he went back up and he had shot a fairly big six pointer. And, uh, I don't know, weighed 175 or something like that. Something like that. Yeah. And, uh, but that was his biggest deer he'd ever shot. Mm-hmm. And he was back to the tent by seven o'clock or seven 30. Doesn't get much better than and, that. And so Throw by the time we bed. got his deer cleaned out and hung and whatever, I said, well, I may as well go back up and sit there. So it was like 10 o'clock. I got back up, up there, nine, nine 30, 10 o'clock. And I shot my deer at like 10 30. Geez. So they're coming right through there. Ten, oh yeah. That was a 10 pointer. Wow. And he weighed 185, I think it was, or one, no, 179, I think it was. Yeah. That's a good buck. Yeah. So, yeah, 10-pointer. He was had a busted up rack, though, so I didn't get him mounted. I yep. just had the, did the antler mount. Yep. Jeez. Anybody else kill any more deer off of Rob's knob since then? Uh, no, I don't was, think so. That was the last one. We got to. I saw deer there, yeah. and the, they were, the best buck that came through there was During the year the day. after. <laughs> It came through. Nobody was there. It was before we it, I went up. Had it on trail camera. And I had, oh, yeah. I had it on trail camera, and it came right down the trail, stopped right where he could have shot it, and that was a nice big eight-pointer. It was over 200 pounds, I'd say. Wow. And Good it was right there. in the sunshine. Yeah. It was 2.30 in the afternoon, and nobody was there. Yeah. That's the year we had the blind there, but. Yeah. Huh. So. Yeah, because Kenny and I sat there a couple times when it was really cold out. Yeah. We put a heater in there so we could stay warm. And what we see, Kenny, 11 deer in two days? Yeah. But Something no, like no, uh, well, we, we figured a couple of them were nubbies, but they weren't, mm. you know, they were the stocky bucks, but they, they didn't have antlers, you know, nothing you could see. Yep. And, uh, but we saw 11 deer in two days out of that block. Is it just a good funnel right there? Just Yeah, it's just it happens, a natural uh, funnel. There's a lake there and it's a end of the lake where it comes in there and they come around that the hardwoods on the end of that lake hmm. and just it's and just a natural back up on the ridge and that's the way they're headed so kind of like a natural little pinch point oh yeah thing. oh yeah yeah you guys still got trail cameras and stuff there uh, we try to put one up every year there yeah. just to yeah. see what so you what's guys happening. don't run much for trail cameras is it more just for fun just to see what's going yeah. on yeah. yeah yeah nice that's cool no we don't run a, we don't run a lot of them we've gotten some good buck pictures on them mm-hmm. so mm-hmm well, yeah. See, out here we we have trail cameras everywhere. I I have a dominant scrape up in Bayfield County, Wisconsin, which is way up near Lake Superior, where we hunt. And there's a dominant scrape up there that over the years I've had 25 different bucks on camera. And I and one year in particular, I had nine different rack bucks on camera on that on that one camera, and they were all they all stopped. To, Chew on the same tree and freshen the same scrape. Just a big community scrape, then, huh? Yep. Hmm. Yep. How? And, uh, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. No, that's okay. Um, so, just speaking, I mean, now that you live out there and you, and, you know, you grew up hunting Vermont and Maine, how do you like hunting out there compared to Maine? Do you prefer it out there, or do you prefer coming back east? Um, I like to eat the venison, so I prefer to be here to shoot some deer yeah. because it's pretty liberal. Um, like. When you buy your sportsman's license here, you can have as many as nine tags. Really? And that's Wisconsin, yeah. you said, right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. There's that so, many deer running around out there. Oh, they're yeah. everywhere. We, our hunting group out here generally shoots uh, 
in the in the twenties, um, um, you know, twenty deer, um, and a lot of times twenty in archery and twenty in gun. Wow. So we, you know, we take our group does a lot. Like we're going up this weekend to a friend's house, and we we make our brats and our ground burger and all that stuff one weekend of the year. Mm-hmm. Last year we did nine hundred and forty pounds of processed. Nine hundred and forty pounds of meat. Nine hundred forty. Wow. So you're not yeah. going hungry out there this winter then. So if I need some venison, if I run out for my deer this year, I'm going to give you a shout. I got your well, number now. <laughs> yeah. I tell you, that I passed, I passed on four deer in the late season because they were smaller. And, and I, I did take one small buck. Um, so I do have some venison in the freezer and I got enough scraps to make my, uh, about 30 pounds of, uh, ground stuff. So we aren't going to go hungry, yep. but I could have eaten a lot better if I just pulled the trigger on several. Yeah. Hey. So, but you know, I, I, I wanted to, you know, we were in an area managing it for a guy and he told us we could take one big buck and we had seven different rack bucks on camera right in this area. And it's, it's really a little gold mine. It's 28 acres in between housing development in the city limits. No kidding. And it's an old farm and there's literally so many deer there that it would scare you. Wow. I mean, I, I shot a doe last year in January when I pulled the trigger, there was 30 deer within sight of us in blind. 30 deer. That's yeah, right. which is it's crazy. People can't even now. It's not like that every time. Yeah, but you know, um, but because I came back to Maine for two and a half weeks, I missed our archery hunt up north, and I didn't I didn't hunt during the gun season, which normally gets me. I usually get a deer um, up north with a bow and another one with a gun. You know, it's pretty much it's not guaranteed, but it's pretty good odds. Know, yeah, pretty good odds, and we don't necessarily look for the giant buck. <laughs> yep. I mean, I did one of the deer that Jimmy will show you the videos, but one of the deer, my biggest Wisconsin buck dressed right at 200 pounds. And I shot that one, um, after, a we had a 17 inch snowstorm and uh, the next morning I, I walked up and put my stuff outside the blind. I never touched the blind because I had deer feeding in the, in the acorns all week long behind me. And that was Thanksgiving day. And so I still hunted down to a little oak bench and i shot him halfway between my blind and the bench and uh he was a, a big eight pointer and one of the bigger deer that we've got up here nice that's awesome so. i was gonna I even mean, you kind of answered my question uh before being that it's a small chunk of woods but i've been hearing some stuff recently from out midwest some some hunters and farmers and stuff saying that the wolf problem's getting real bad up in the northern parts of wisconsin and minnesota are you seeing any of that or is that yeah way up above you I- yeah, I've I've got uh, wolves on camera on my on my trail cams, and I actually had two of them come by my blind while I was sitting in the blind. So 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 they're starting to put a beating on the deer herd up in the northern part, right? Yeah, they are. Yeah. And and uh, the big problem is in the spring, like this year, there was not much of a fawn crop uh, because the the deer last last winter, not this winter here, but uh, the the 2022 to 23. The winter they had eight feet of snow up there where we hunt and so the deer really got winter killed bad up there Mm -hmm. and um that along with the wolves and the coyotes and in the spring the bears the bear population in wisconsin has exploded and they they figure that they eat 40 percent of the fawn crop every year in the northern part of the state 40 percent. wow that's a big number yeah so i mean and there's still a lot of deer you know i mean the guys i didn't hunt with them this year up north um, but they, I had a camera up there because I, I bow hunted a little bit up there earlier and I put a camera up on my dominant scrape and I had, uh, four or five different bucks, but no big bucks. Mm-hmm. And they said that there was literally no big bucks around up there this year because they all died mm-hmm. over the winter. So it's going to be a few years before that comes back. But typically we, you know, we had a lot of bucks and a lot of deer up there and you, and it's pretty liberal. You can get a doe tag, um, pretty easy. So we always have doe tags. Yep. And they encourage you to, you know, the insurance companies want you to shoot every deer in Wisconsin because they, they have so many deer car collisions here. It's unbelievable. Mm-hmm. They kill more deer out there with cars than we kill in, in the state. Do they hunting. really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. They, they kill more deer with cars than there is in the state of Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. A lot more. Oak. You have a lot of oaks and stuff over there, right? Yeah. The, the, where, where I predominantly hunt in, in uh, the northern part of the state is all on an oak ridge mm-hmm. and it's um you know there's there's some ponds around it and it's actually there's a hiking trail that goes in and i hike up about a half a mile and then you know on a, a little oak knoll mm-hmm. and it's all oaks all around me i can hear the acorns falling and 
And literally, like I said, that one year when I shot that eight pointer, I could hear the deer pulling in the leaves and eating acorns all day long from my blind. And I couldn't see it. There's a, there's a red brush, red brush draw mm. between me and them. And it's pretty thick. So you have to kind of pick your way through. And like I said, I was halfway down picking my way through that when that buck stepped up out of his bed. And when he came out of his bed, I knew he was, he was going to die real quick because it was, I could see the body was a giant body and chocolate Brown. You know, when you've hunted as many years as I have and seen as many deer as I have and big bucks and and believe me, I haven't shot all of them by a long stretch, but uh, you know, the minute that deer stood up, I knew that it was a, a giant buck and, and he took two steps and he was in a little bit of an opening and I could see the rack and, the rest is history. Can't beat that. Hmm. A question for you guys, speaking of oak trees, back in the day in Maine, before it was all cut to hell and stuff, do you guys ever run into any oak trees up there or no? No. No, I was going to say, they just don't really grow beach. that much up there. Beach. Yeah. Used to yeah. be uh, some huge beech ridges, and they went in, and uh, after they got done cutting the softwood, they come back in, start taking hardwood, and they pretty well mopped the, the beech ridges. Yep. That's too bad. A That's... lot of times back then, you'd go mm-hmm. through there and the bears had been in there and the deer, and it was like it was rototilled. Yeah. The leaves were all kicked up under the mm-hmm. whole ridge. Yeah. I see that in Vermont on some of those beach ridges when yeah. you're on the good year. Yeah. But I got, let's, uh, let's do one more story from each of you guys, and then we'll start wrapping it up. I know you said you've gotten three bucks, Ken, since the big die off 2008, 2009. So what's your best buck since then? More recent buck? Uh, 208. 208? Eight pointer. Bear ground or tracking? Uh, bear. Well, I've got one off each. Let's hear them. Uh, the first one tracking, I went down into the softwood. We had about six, eight inches of wet, heavy snow. And I got down in there and I see a fairly decent track. And he was going the opposite direction as what I was going. So I turned around and went uphill up onto a flat. And I got up onto this flat and there's deer running. I said, God, that's funny. I, I don't know what's going on. I haven't jumped these deer. Mm-hmm. And I said, I'm, I'm fairly close. So I went out through across this hardwood flat and they was running tracks, running tracks. And I said, I don't know what the hell's going on. So I stood there for a minute and all of a sudden I look up and here comes a deer running right at me. And it was a doe. And she come out by within, I don't know, 20 yards or so of me, come out by, and I just watched her go by, and then I just stood there, and pretty quick I could hear this male coming. He's Mm. grunting like a pig. (laughs) I said, wow, I guess that's why she's running. So I let it come right up fairly close. It was a eight-pointer, weighed 208. Yep. Come right, she run him right by you. Yeah, he yeah. just he was walking. He didn't uh, he didn't run. He was just hot stepping it out across there. Just right behind her. Yeah, nice. That's yeah. I, that's a good one. And then I shot another one. I went up on this hardwood ridge. It was uh, I think it was the first week of the season. It was warm, and they hunted up across the ridge there. And it was getting late in the afternoon. And I said, well, I better head down and kind of head back towards camp. So I was coming down off the ridge. And all of a sudden, there was a bunch of swale grass, and I was in an old skitter rut. And I come down through there, and all of a sudden, I looked up, and there's a buck standing there. Right in the skitter rut? Right in the skitter rut. Nice. And I looked at it, and I said, well, I, I don't think I'm going to shoot that. And I put the gun down, and then I got to looking at it, and I said, geez, that's got a long body on it. So I pulled up and shot, and behind it was another buck. And I don't know what it had for antlers, but that one went out by, and the one that I shot turned and went uphill. And that was 208. Another 208? Yeah. Jeez. So they're just, were they just feeding in that skitter yeah, trail? Yeah, they, they had been uh, laying down there or something, and I walked onto them. I come down off the hill, and I just happened to walk onto them. They was two bucks together. Yeah. That's a, that's a good lesson right there for people that, that uh, hunt nowadays. You just get out in the woods, and you never know what happens. You oh, know? exactly. Yeah, you just got to be out there. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Jim? What's one of your more recent ones? Uh, my best one that I've shot is was in 2015. And that one, the day before that, uh, one of our other guys shot a buck in this area. We were working up this ridge. It was an old cut. And uh, so I was off to his right, and he was off to the left quite a ways, you know, like half a mile or so. I don't know. I heard him shoot, but... Uh, when he shot his deer, he got a, like a eight pointer or something like that. 
Um, and so at that point, I had just come on a really fresh scrape. And so I knew there was this, to my right, there's a flowage that goes up through and they really like to hang out in that area, mm. a lot of softwood. And so what I did is I locked that scrape into my GPS mm. and because we were going to get gathered up and go help our other guy get his deer out, um, Brian. And so I had to come back down to the road. And so I went back down to the road. I went and got his truck and these guys were met up already and started dragging his deer out. And uh, so they got his deer out and we got out of there. And then the next day we we said, well, I'd like to go back up to where that scrape was and see what we can find. And that the next day was Thanksgiving day. And so I did that. It was pretty much bare ground then all the snow had gone off um we had snow earlier but this it had melted off so it was bare ground it was wicked frosty that morning crunchy Mm -hmm. crunchy leaves so i said well i'm gonna go up by that scrape and if i find a good spot i'm gonna sit down and do some grunting Mm -hmm. so i got up there went past the scrape got over to an area that looked good where i could see some had some openings and I made one set of, I sat down, I made one set of grunts and nothing. So I was just listening and like I said, it was crisp clear morning there. And so I waited 10, 15 minutes and I did another set of grunts. And the next thing I could hear was thump, 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 thump. And I looked over and I see this rack coming out of the softwoods. And I could hear his feet hitting. It was He's so crunchy. He was coming looking for you because you're grunting. He was, he was yep. all bristled up. Yep. Yeah. And all he was coming to out for yep. to fight. How far from you? Uh, it was probably 75, 80 yards across to where we came out. Yep. And like I said, I could hear that thumping, and I see that rack coming out through the alders. And I said, that's big enough for me. Mm-hmm. And so he came down through, and I said, well, I got one opening down through here. If he goes through there, I'm going to give it a shot. you know. And then there was some other openings after that. But he came through that opening, and I put it right on him touched it off and he bucked up and and started to run and so I said I I think I hit him good and then he, he went down and I could I heard a big crash and then it went silent and I said well that's a good sign yeah and so I went down to the alders where I thought he was when I shot couldn't find any hair couldn't find any blood and I said boy I I know I was right on him good. So I just started making loops down the, down below and there was a skitter rut down there so I went down that and I started working my way around to where I could hear that that what I heard thrash there. Mm-hmm. And I looked over and I could see the rack sticking up and he was laid there and what he did it is he ran right into a tree and took a big gouge out of it and then he skidded to a halt. Jeez. Right there and I'd hit him right through the heart. Yep. So he didn't go that far then. No, was he just he plugged went, up, or from what you shot, no blood, just yeah. He, he just he, he didn't. I didn't get a pass through. I don't think so. It mm. wasn't. He wasn't spraying. Yep. And like I said, it was bare ground, so yep. it was hard to see anyway, and it was pretty thick there. Mm-hmm. So I just started down. And that's a good point too. You know, when you make sure you listen, because he crashed there, and when you hear that, it's pretty distinct. Yep. And he, like I said, he he probably ran into a tree that was like this big and. Took a big swipe out of it. Was one of his straight onto it. Yeah, wow. and then he was just. I'll show you the picture. I think I showed it to you anyway, but I'll show you that after. But anyways, yeah. he was just laid right there, and there's a perfect spot right behind his shoulder. Sharpshooter. So, yeah. <laughs> what was that buck? What do you have for a rack on him? He he's a eight pointer, and he weighed one ninety seven on Thanksgiving day. That's a so, good buck. Yeah. All day long. Yeah. Yeah. It's a 200 pounder. You yeah. just took a little bit too much fat out of it. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I said. Boy, if I knew he was that close, I would have not taken so much stuff out. Yeah. But I, I said, you know, I didn't care cause it was, no matter. It, I said, I know that's a 200 pound buck all day, uh, absolutely. you know, earlier on in the season. Yep. Yeah. Can't beat that. So, what, a, what about you, Gary? What's one of your more recent ones? Um, well, I haven't been back to Maine a ton of times, but uh, one one buck in particular, um, I was hunting my favorite ridge, Locomo Ridge, 
just up over from where I shot that 11 pointer. And um, we had uh, crunchy snow on the ground. It was all froze up really bad. And, and uh, I went up through this cut road that it goes all the way up through the south woods where they had them piled up before and, and it had grown up to, I don't know, 15 feet, 15 foot um, spruces in there. And then they put a cut road right up through the middle of it to take the hardwood off the ridge. And so I, um, Jimmy and I decided one afternoon we were going to go over there and check that out. So he has a little trail. He likes to go up on the right-hand side. And I go up the road further and I go up through that cut road. And we we're going to meet on the back side up there, sort of up on the ridge, just from where I shot that 11 pointer. Anyway, started up through there and, uh, I got all the way up to the end and, and, uh, had, there was quite a bit of snow on the ground. It had snowed and frozen, so there was like eight or ten inches of snow. Mm -hmm. And uh, right when it opens up into the hardwoods, it was a hardwood slash in there. They had cut it and it had grown back up into those smoky brush whips that we call them, beach whips and stuff. So anyway, I uh, there was a big stump there, and it was about three feet tall. And they would cut a giant tree right on the corner. And so I uh, I said, well, I should just get up on that stump and kick off the ice and stuff and see what I can see here. Cause it, it, there was deer tracks around. So anyway, I, I jumped up on the stump and, and, uh, kicked off. I'm kicking off all the frost and the snow off the stump. And I look at about 60 yards out in front of me up comes this buck and he's got real light antlers and they're high and they're pretty wide. And he starts out through there and I said, well, that's a good one. So again, I opened up on him and, um, uh, I shot four times at him going out through there, but it was, you know, I mean, yes, I had decent shots and it was on snow. So I knew if I hit him, it wasn't a problem. I could follow him, but he got into the softwoods. And when he, where he went into the softwoods, I went down and I walked over there and the whole corner was torn up. There was scrapes and there was trees ripped up. And I said, well, I found his bedroom and, uh, there was no blood or any hair or anything in his track. So I said, well, guess you didn't touch that one <laughs> so we got out of there and you know i talked to jimmy on the radio i told him i shot and said well i'm gonna track him he's a nice buck so i took him down through over a couple ridges below us and they had to drive around and pick me up later on and so three days later we decided we were going to go back up in there and check that out again and uh we had two trails that went up the ridge yeah and mine was the first trail and then his was down further mm -hmm. And that's where yep. he shot at that deer. So I said, well, yep. I'm going to go up my trail and go ahead, Gary. Yeah. And so he, he, again, he went up his trail again and I went to the cut road and I was about three quarters of the way up the cut road. And all of a sudden, bam, this buck steps out right into the cut road and same buck, giant rack, you know, big rack, white, real light colored antlers, not dark colored, real light colored antlers, and big body. He steps out of the cut road. So I decided, well, I guess I'll take that one. <laughs> yeah. So I pulled up and he was probably 110 yards up through there. And I pulled up and just as I was squeezing the trigger, he slipped because all the skitter ruts were full of water and they had froze up and that deer slipped and he almost fell down on the ice. Hmm. And I, and I said, Whoa, don't pull trigger now. And so he, then he swapped ends and he was walking away from me. And I, you know, the rack was up there and sticking out and, and the deer was walking away and he's just walking. And I said, I got to take a shot here pretty soon. So I planted it right about tail level, a little lower. And I let one drive. When I did, I broke his hip and he went down in the road. And, um, so then I decided I was going to put him out of his misery. So I shot twice more. And every time I pulled the trigger, he fell down. And uh, the shots went right over him. So I said, well, this is kind of stupid. Why are you shooting 110 yards when you can walk up and shoot him at 10 yards? Because he's got a broken hip. He can't get up. Yeah. <laughs> so I went up the road, and finally he got up on his front legs again, and I shot him and dropped him right there. And so I walked up to the deer, and I'm, I'm looking at the deer, and uh, all of a sudden I hear the brush cracking and something coming through the brush, and I'm like, oh. What, we got another deer coming out here or what? I look and here comes the orange hat. And, and I said, oh, there's obviously somebody on that deer. Oh, no. And uh, so the guy, the kid 
comes out through and he, he's a young gentleman that I coached in Little League. And really? him and his buddies were hunting up there, Tyler Osmond. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> What's Tyler the chance of that? Yeah. That buck, and uh, he, he, he said, is that you, Evan? He was hunting with Evan Bauer. And I said, nope. And he looked, he takes a couple steps and he goes, Mr. Sergeant, what are you doing up here? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm shooting this buck. <laughs> and so he came out through and, and uh, Evan came down around the corner. He was up above. Evan was hiding Diving behind for that. cover. <laughs> Evan was hiding behind that stump that I stood on and shot the buck the last time. Oh, and he wow. said he could hear the bullets going up through there. Woo, woo. Oh, no. He said, there was a bunch of shooting going on. I said, well, yeah, that would be me. And uh, so anyway, Tyler said, well, you know, he, they took that deer way off on another ridge, like in the morning. And this is later on in the afternoon. And uh, they'd been tracking it forever. And he was a couple hundred yards behind the deer. He said he kept jumping it, but he never, never could have got a shot at that deer. And he's yep. right where he was, where that deer was going. He wasn't going to get a shot at it. And he so, got right between us. On our, on yeah. I went up my trail. He'd already gone across and I never cut his tracks yeah. or never saw him anyway. Yep. And yeah. so he, he was in between us. Man, and he pushed him right out there. Right place, right time for you. Yeah, and and you know, I I explained to him. I said, well, I shot I shot at this buck four times three days ago up here, mm. and he said, oh yeah. So you knew he was around. I said, yeah. I said that corner up there when you go out in it, it's all torn up. I said I was coming back because he was in here, mm. and he said, well, he said we took him from someplace else, but he said, you know, we'll help you get him out. So him and Evan dragged that deer all the way out. I never had to drag it. That was a good good to have young bucks around <laughs> yeah, yeah that's their that's so, their payback for yeah. you uh coaching them in the yeah. Yeah. yeah so that one was a eight pointer dressed 226 nice that's a great buck yeah so yeah cool story too what's the chance of that running yeah. into somebody you coach in Little League and then they drag it out well that's I not the first time <laughs> no um we were hunting up in the same general area and um brian woodard and john thulman a guy that was in the fire department with kenny and I were up there, and so Kenny was down below us, uh, down in the swamp, and he was chasing deer, and there was there was bucks going everywhere that day. And so John and and uh, I were in Kenny's truck, and we we're listening on the radio for him to check in because we were going to go, you know, we were going to see if we had to pick him up somewhere, drive around or whatever. And, um, and Brian comes down the road and pulls up next on the passenger side next to John, and we're sitting there, and. Uh, all of a sudden, I looked down the road. You know, we could see down the road a couple hundred yards. I looked down the road about 80 to 100 yards down the road. This buck steps up on the edge of the road, and he's going to cross. And I, was, I could see him plain as day. He had a big rack. And I said, John, get your gun. Open the door. Get out. And I said, don't load your gun until you get out. But I said, get ready. There's a buck coming in the road, and you need to shoot him. <laughs> and so he got out, cleared the vehicle, got out, and... I'm, you know, the buck comes up and he now he's in the edge of the road, but I'm not thinking very well because I'm sitting in the driver's seat and he's outside of the vehicle to the right now, you know. And so I got a perfect view of the buck broadside, 100, you know, 80 to 100 yards. Uh, in my mind, I'm thinking, John, you better kill that deer pretty soon because he's going across there. So pretty soon he shoots and the deer runs across the road. And I'm like, oh. So in the meantime, I had grabbed my gun out of the back seat and I was getting ready to go because I, I said, John, somebody's going to shoot that deer for you. <laughs> and so he went running down the road with Brian and there was a, we were right on a corner of a road that goes way up the hill. And, uh, where I shot at another buck one day with two crazy boots on. But anyway, um, we, um, I got out hoping if he came up through, he would, uh, I'd get a shot at him. But anyway, John had hit him. I went down the road and, and, uh, John and, and Brian had gone up in and they shot and finished the deer off. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I was standing in the road and I hear something in the brush and I look, here comes Tyler Osmond up out no. of the wall. Another one. And huh? he looked at me and he goes, Mr. Sergeant, you didn't shoot <laughs> another buck in front of me, did you? And I said, nope, but John did. Oh, God. <laughs> he, he said, well, I better go look at it. 20. 220. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So he went up and looked at the deer and he goes, Yep, that was a good one. So Tyler, oh. I, I said, Tyler, man, I'm sorry. He goes, No. He said, You guys are in the right place. He said, What are you going to do? We had no idea he was down in there. Yeah. You know, but and then and, the more of no idea we were up there. Well, he had about a two mile walk from there to go back to their tent. Mm. He shot an eight pointer, 190 pounds on the way back to the tent. 
So it worked out for him. It worked out. He was happy. What a day then, huh? On a 220-pounder and then shoot a 190. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. But that's the way it happens up there. I mean. Just got to be out there. Yeah. You got to make yourself available. and Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, we'll I'm looking for you. Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, we'll start wrapping it up, but I got one question for you guys. Can you do it collectively or I can go around the table? and, And for you, Gary, for someone that's young and wants to get into hunting in Maine, what would be your best advice or piece of advice for them, being that you guys got, you know, 40 plus years up there? What would you say? You can do it together say, or, or separate. I would I would say that the, my advice to a young person would be you got to get out in the woods and you got to go. And with today's electronics, you shouldn't be worried about where you, you where you are. And, you know, I mean, up there now, there's roads everywhere, mm-hmm. but you got to be willing to spend the time and put some miles in. And learn the territory, learn the territory. And then you'll learn, you know, I've shot several nice bucks up there, knowing where to be at the right place at the right time. Mm-hmm. You know, when we get bucks going and, and, uh, it's, uh, it's been a lot of fun, you know, and, and, uh, I hope to get back up there again and do it some more, but again, we're not young, young men anymore. So it's, it's harder for us, but a young guy should get up there and, and spend the time in the woods and don't be afraid of the woods. Get out and and look for them. Mm-hmm. They're there. That's good advice. Well, Avery, this year when he was up there, he saw two bucks the last day. You know, the, the, he yep. was there. Yep. And I think he saw three or four bucks mm-hmm. there. Just they weren't, they weren't big bucks, yep. but <clears throat> he could have just as well been a big buck. Mm-hmm. Say tracking. Tracking. Put, put your time in and, and go for it. Uh, you know that they're – Ahead of you there somewhere, mm-hmm. and if you, you know, can stay with them long enough, you're going to get them. Yep. Let them show you the way and teach exactly. you. Exactly. Yep. That's yep. good advice for yep. sure. And I would, I would say, buy both the Hal Bloods books and read them cover to cover twice. Yep. Yeah. There's a lot of information out there for it now. Yes. Compared to yeah. back when you guys, you oh, know, yeah. started up there, there's yeah. a lot more information out there now. But well, yeah, we we were self taught deer hunters because yeah. our family were, you know, we're not big deer hunters before our generation. Mm-hmm. And um, we had to get out and learn, and and we were fortunate that we had the three of us collectively to teach each other mm-hmm. and learn together. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you guys have all had success too, and a lot of good good times together too. You know, oh yeah, you guys double yeah. teaming them, and you working yeah. with your brother in law that big one, and you guys just as a whole, you know, yeah. dissecting the woods yeah. and, and feedback and everything. My grandfather still holds the record though for, of all of us. Oh, he does. His, yeah, 1958, he shot a buck in vermont um 258 pounds 258 just 265 excuse oh, me okay. 265, 265, yeah. 265 in vermont in vermont yeah. you guys i got still, a picture of that rack you? for you yeah. yeah do you guys still have the rack in the family oh yeah yeah, yeah. 265 that's like old school vermont too yeah. before they reintroduced he, he has it hanging off a off the side of, of his, his garage garage right. there and, it's and, it, and it's like twice the length that he is yeah. unbelievable yeah nice rack on it too it yeah. was ten point. It was an eight pointer, yeah. but it's a fairly heavy one. Yep. Yeah, yeah, and it's dried out and shrunk a lot because it sat over the fireplace for I don't know twenty five years. Yeah, or more, maybe more. They can't. <clears throat> Kenny's son Greg said he's he's going to get it set up one of these years. So if he shoots a decent buck that he doesn't want to have mounted himself, he'll use cape a cape on that. And, That'd be cool. Yeah. Be a piece of family history right there to keep yeah. on passing down. Two sixty five, huh? Yeah, two sixty five. <sighs> Yeah. For mob buck, they and there was no roads in there. That t- they had to take a boat up to the end of the pond. Oh, really? At yeah. our camp there, sort of full on adventure then to yeah. get that buck. And he went up in there and it, he shot a, a two fifty three thousand savage. Yeah, nice. Yeah, incredible. One shot and dropped it. And... The rest is history. Yeah, nice. Well, you guys got anything else you want to add in before we sign off for the night? No, I just, uh, you know, if you're young and you want to get out, Maine's definitely the place to go. Do it now yeah. before yes. you get too old. And, yes. Yeah, that's, and, a, that's and a big use, piece of advice. Use that young legs because you need it in that country up there these days. Mm-hmm. Definitely. It's not like it used to be. When we when we were first there, all those tote roads, you could walk for miles and miles. Well, the one road there, one winter road that we hunt, goes 10 miles. Oh, really? So you can just walk, 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 and then peel off when you want to. Yeah. 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 Nice. Because hmm. we have a guy that hiked it all the way, the old hiker. Yeah. 
He did the full 10 miles out? Oh, yeah. He just had somebody take him up at the end where it come out on the end of the Golden Road, and he said, I'm going to walk back to camp. All right. Hey, if you're feeling it. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess we can wrap it up then. If you want to hang on the phone there for a minute, Gary, we'll uh, just sign off on the podcast and uh, appreciate you guys doing this. And we'll have it no out this problem. week probably. All right. Thank you, Ron. See you guys on the next episode. Yeah. You're listening to Stagger Cast, brought to you by Stagger Gear.